Yes, interaction between ballast list track and bridge structures. Uh, I'm going to talk for about 15 minutes about what the subject is and what the background to this issue is, and then Mike's going to talk for whatever is left of 30 minutes about a case study. I threatened to talk for 28 minutes and challenge him to finish it too, but I'll, I'll, I won't really do that. Are you going to just wait there? Are you? Yeah, 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 we'll have a... We'll see how we go. So, um, railways on bridges. Oops, right, go the right way. Um, second time today we've mentioned the Sutton and Carlisle line, but um, we, ever since there have been railways, we've put them on bridges. And this goes back 140 years, so this is the way it used to be done. But there have been some fairly significant changes in how we design railway bridges, and um, we we'll sum them up by looking at old structures like this, which are pretty rigid bridge structures, quite short spans, I think 40 feet in this case, between piers. And then on top of that, we put a fairly flexible track structure, light rail sections, jointed rail, wooden sleepers in ballast. Contrast that to what's happening now on high-speed lines. There's a rather different bridge. This is on the Honam line in, in South Korea. So the way we're building bridges now is to have much more flexible bridge structures, much longer spans, and then on top of that, we put a relatively rigid track structure, especially if we go to ballast track. So we've got continuous rails, we've got concrete slabs, and a very different um, interaction between the two. So why does, why does any of that matter? What does it have to do with uh, ballastless tracks on high speed lines? Well, getting back to a few of the basics, that's supposed to be a representation of a piece of, uh, a piece of railway track on, on the ground. Um, and just a reminder, I mean, mostly PW, uh, permanent way engineers here of some sort, just a reminder, continuous welded rail does not expand or contract. It stays the same length, whatever we do to it, particularly whatever temperature it's at. Keep that in your mind as we go through the rest of this. So there's a bit of track on the ground. What happens if we put a bridge in there? I'll keep it simple at this stage, a nice short bridge. Bridges are different. They're longer on hot days than they are on cold days. Uh, they also bend if there's a train on them, and they shift if the train driver hits the brakes. So what happens on a cold day? The bridge contracts. Just take this as an example of, of how the bridge moves. The bridge contracts, and the longer the bridge is, the, the more that free end of the bridge is going to move. So if we plot a, plot a graph of displacement of the bridge, we'll get something like that, that the... Uh, there's a, a fixed amount of displacement, which is mainly a function of the length of the bridge. Provided there's enough give, shall we call it, between the rail and the bridge deck, that doesn't actually matter to the rail. The rail, if it's continuous, remains the same length. And if we plot a graph of rail displacement, it's zero all the way. We could also plot a graph of any additional stresses that are put in the rail. And again, in this case, it's all zero because the rail is not doing anything. The other thing just to put onto the graph, because it matters on some of the later pictures, is the relative displacement between the rail and the bridge deck is the same as the movement of the bridge deck, because the rail hasn't moved. So that much is easy. But of course, in real life, there is never enough give between the rail and the bridge. And to some extent, what's going to happen is that as the bridge deck moves, the rail will get dragged along with it. And so we get, get, get the point. Of, whoops, I've pressed the wrong button, haven't I? I'm going to be in trouble with the man upstairs. So we get a, a, a differential movement of the rail. It's got to go back to zero at the other end because the rail can't expand or contract. So therefore, if we don't put a break in the rail, at the point where the rail goes over the discontinuity in the bridge, we're going to get a step in the displacement of the rail. The slope of that line is equal to the strain in the rail and therefore proportional to the stress in the rail. So we can say that the relative movement between the bridge and the rail has, has actually been reduced because the rail is following the bridge, but it generates a peak stress in the rail, which coincides with the, the steepest slope of that line and therefore is directly over the join. So that's the sort of nature of the problem. If we fix the rail down more securely onto the bridge, as effectively we do when we go to non-ballasted track, um, the rail stays with the bridge even more and we get an even more severe step which gives us, again, even less 
relative displacement, but even higher peak stresses. So that's, that's the nature of the problem. I could go through this again, instead of putting temperature in, putting in traction and braking effects. There's also effects of bridge deck bending under the weight of the train, which affects the longitudinal stresses in the rail. And you'll get a similar kind of picture building up. So what can the track engineer do about it? I could do a different talk about what can the bridge designer do about it. Um, <laughs> that's... It can be, it can be a, 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 a worthwhile conversation, but for, t for this afternoon, what can the track engineer do about it? Well, you've actually got a choice, a choice of two things. First one is cut the rail. Put a discontinuity in the rail where the discontinuity is in the structure. And there's somebody doing exactly that on an urban railway in the States. Um, that solves the problem. The, the rail stress goes, uh, goes down to zero, and uh, we can live with that. The problem is that Rail expansion joints, first of all, are quite expensive to install. They're also expensive to maintain. I, I've, uh, I've never yet met a permanent way maintenance engineer who likes rail expansion joints. <laughs> the, everybody's headache. Um, on urban railways, it's a, they're a source of noise, especially if they're not perfectly maintained. It all adds up to the fact that we really don't want to put rail expansion joints in unless we have to, and especially on a high-speed ballastless track, the last thing we want to do is put unnecessary rail expansion joints in. I accept there are such things as necessary ones, but there are not very many of them. So that's option one. Option two is accept that the stress is going to go up, um, which, first of all, gives us all as P-way engineers a slight uneasy feeling between our shoulder blades, but if you think... Go back 30 or 40 years, we had the same axle loads on our tracks as we have now. We had lighter rail sections, wider sleeper spacings, um, and it wasn't a complete catastrophe. There's all sorts of good reasons we've gone to heavier rail sections, closer spacings, and so on. But there is actually a bit of spare capacity in the rail to take some stresses, locally at least. And we can think about, can we live with that uh, in order to avoid putting rail expansion joints in? But there has to be some limit to how much extra stress we can accept. Um, and there was a UIC... <coughs> oh, sorry. First of all, the, the, the easy way to put a limit on the amount of stress is to put a limit on the length of bridge over which you can have continuous welded rail without a joint. And written into network rails um, uh, um, standards, there is a suggestion that you shouldn't go more than 30 metres as a bridge expansion length before you put rail expansion joints in. And most European railways have a similar rule. Um, it's a catch-all, and it doesn't really fix the problem. The other thing we can do is actually explicitly put a limit on how much stress that we can put into the rail. And I'm talking here about how much stress we put in over and above the stress which would be there anyway if we put the same track form with the same train on the track without a bridge. So we're looking at how much extra stress can we put into the rail. So... Back in the early 1990s, UIC had a, a working group looking at this subject, and, and they looked at specifically the case of 60E1 rail, as we would call it now, R260 grade, 650mm spacing, concrete sleepers. So what we would today think of as pretty standard track. Um, and looking at straight track or very large radius curves. <clears throat> they came to the conclusion that under that configuration, you could put in an extra 92 megapascals of stress in the rail in tension without an undue risk of a rail fatigue failure, and you could go to 72 megapascals in compression without an undue risk of track buckling. But those numbers, anyone who's touched this subject will have probably recognised 92 and 72. Unfortunately, the conditions above often get lost, and it is the answer for a very specific case. That data has also been copied into the Euro code for bridge designers. So bridge designers are actually required to design their bridges in a way which limits the rail stress to these values. And again, you may find some people feeling slightly uncomfortable that your bridge design colleagues are being asked to work out the stress in the rail. But that's the way it is. Because UIC leaflets are advisory, but for the structure designer, in many cases, the Euro code is mandatory. So what we've been doing over the last two or three years, I've had the, the, the privilege and the frustration of chairing a European task group uh, with a combination of bridge engineers and track engineers looking at what should be put in the next revision of the Eurocode on this subject. 
Um, what we've also been doing is developing a SEND technical report, which will go with it. And the current draft is 85 pages long, so I'm not going to cover all of it in a 15-minute presentation. But we are doing quite a bit of work on looking at what is, where the gaps are in the current standards. Um, a lot of background technical information is going into that report. Um, explicitly talks about ballast tracks, which were missing from the earlier documents. Some discussion, at least, of what happens when you've got curves, S&C, lighter rail sections, and so on, on bridges. Calculation methods for track and bridge engineers. Case studies, worked examples, recommendations for future standards development. And recommendations for future R&D. There's a few issues where we actually don't have any clue what the real answer is. So that, that work is going on. Um, what we're looking at is... A, so from the track engineer's point of view, you've always going to have to come back to these two options. Am I going to put rail expansion joints in, or am I going to live with this increased rail stress? Um, and one of the things Mike is going to talk about is ways in which you can at least limit that rail stress without putting a cut in the rail, um, by allowing, as I put it, more give between the track and the bridge. So I think that's, yes. So I'll hand over to Mike, who's going to do some, some, some real bridges rather than theoretical bridges. Ooh, okay. Excellent. Right. Uh, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Um, so, uh, picking up where, where David left off, or just to recap, uh, th this is a, a sort of typical arrangement of simply supported bridge structures, uh, 30 between about well, 20 to 40 metres long, that's the sort of norm. Um, and the, the reason for that is that the expansion and contraction of these units is so small that the <coughs> Um, stress induced in the rail is quite uh, well is well within the the criteria which David mentioned earlier. Uh, so what's happening now with high speed trains? The whole concept has changed. Um, we are having um, continuous rails and uh, structures which are far longer and far more complex than the example here. So. Um, we're sort of moving now into long welded rails have been around for a long time and initially the rail expansion joints which you saw earlier were installed in the track um, after the jointed track had been taken away. Um, now during expansion and contraction of the structure the, the rail stress will be compressive or tensile depending on which way the structure is moving. The compressive stress is a problem with ballast track due to the, track, the potential for track buckling. Um, but hopefully with ballastless track it will not occur. And I'm certainly not aware of it happening so far. This, this opens up quite a, a change in the design criteria for the structures. The, as David said, the rail expansion joints are capital intensive, maintenance intensive, and they also pro provide a discontinuity in the rail which causes uh, unnecessary noise and vibration. The um, rail, the track itself, is subjected on a, on a structure. It's subjected obviously from above by the train acceleration and braking forces and the dynamic loading and also the nosing forces and lateral wind loading on the train. And it's also on the structure subjected to the, the bending and torsion effects of the deck and the thermal movement of the, of the deck as well, which is, this is, the, these two are the main, the main problems. Now, the distri distribution of the forces in the rails uh, very much depends on the clamping force, the tow load of the, fast, the rail fastening system. And... What uh, Pandrel have introduced is the ZLR. This is a zero longitudinal um, uh, rail fastening, which actually lifts off the, the foot of the rail and allows the rail um, to be decoupled from the structure. More on that in a minute. A bit of a, a commercial here for HS2. Being an independent consultant, I can... I can add, add, the, add my own opinion here. <laughs> um, it, it's very true that HS2 <coughs> is a completely new concept in railway 
uh, design in UK. And it's uh, the opportunity to in incorporate ballastless track and components on a continuous structure uh, can now be introduced in this country based on the extensive experience um, made from Europe and in the Far East. And I'm suggesting the whole of HS2 for, is to be slab track, but that's not, that's not kosher at the moment. Uh, the track form, the uh, balsas track is basically free from maintenance and its design life has numerous environmental benefits. And uh, this, the, the, unfortunately, these are not built into the, the costing of ballastless versus ballasted track or slab track versus ballasted track. Um, there are, it's not only the fact that you need to have extensive tamping and lining of the, the ballasted track, it's the environmental impact <coughs> and the fact that you've got to go out at night to do this work. And that there are fewer and fewer men who are prepared to drive these machines at two o'clock in the morning. Uh, uh, the cost of that, those people is going up. So that has to be taken into account in the pricing, the cost of the slab track. Um, ballast flight, that's been mentioned by Peter this morning. Um, another issue is the environmental benefits of ballast track, um, ballast track with, uh, uh, during the construction phase. Um, there's a concern of dust and noise during the installation of the ballast and the transporting of ballast from the, uh, from the quarries, which could be several hundred kilometres away. Um, one, one issue that I'm quite strongly <coughs> in favour of this, uh, the idea of the ballastless track is, uh, is a structure itself, uh, uh, something which is difficult with ballast, because ballast is a very variable material, whereas a, a ballastless track comprises of steel and concrete and rubber, which we all know the properties of and we can work out exactly how it will perform and it performs in that manner and hopefully for at least uh, 20 years and longer, 80 or years for the structure itself, for the concrete. Um, now, the going back to uh, David's point about uh, 7743 for the permissible <coughs> rail compressive stress. Uh, when I was faced with this uh, d design requirement in Bangkok, it was pretty obvious that there was no track buckling, so we could use the 92 megapascals for both compression and in tension, which uh, made quite a difference to the design. The, um, now, this is something away from the track, is the, the structure itself, and we were discussing this at lunchtime. Um, when structural engineers work out the expansion and contraction of a structure, they take the free length and multiply it by the coefficient of expansion of the, the concrete, unless uh, somebody wants to correct me on that. Um, and the, sorry, that's uh, the, um, the, the observations which uh, are ongoing in Germany at, at, the, at this time show that the actual expansion is not only considerably less, it's probably less than a half or it may be a fraction of that because the reason is that the structure does not have time to adapt to the temperature rise during the day. So it never actually reaches the temperature of the day. And the, the, the critical, more critical, is the an annual change. But the annual change takes place very slowly so the track can adjust to that. So um, the, the result is that the there's an actual reduction in the expansion of the deck and that will result in a lower stress transmission to the rails. Now this is all theoretical and it's ongoing at the moment as I say. Um, just to explain in a bit more detail, this is a typical section of a pre-stress box for a, a rail, the track goes on top of there. Um, the, if the, in the daytime the sun's shining on one side of the structure but it's not on this side. So it doesn't mean that if the temperature goes up from, say, 10 degrees in the morning up to 30 in the day, that this will expand by uh, the tw uh, 20 degrees or so. It, it just doesn't happen. And uh, one of the reasons is that this, this huge structure doesn't, it cannot warm up to that higher temperature. So this is a complete, you know, complete reassessment of the, um, the, the, the structural requirements. Um, 
This, uh, so the, the, my interest in the avoiding of rail expansion joints actually was stimulated by an article in the Handel magazine um, about 10 years ago. And I, so I, ha I had a solution here, which was this um, zero low longitudinal uh, restraint fastening, but I didn't have a problem. But along came this Norwegian structural engineer in Bangkok who said to me he wanted to design for the new metro system a series of continuous viaduct beams uh, being planned through the city. And this is the nice thing about the Far East. You can, somebody comes along and it can design whatever he likes and the, uh, everybody basically goes along with it. And uh, so the, the challenge was then to incorporate this requirement into the track structure <coughs> of the metro. So working with Pandrel and uh, with a structural engineer, we, come, we worked out the, um, the requirement of the location of the, um, the zero longitudinal restraint fastenings. The, the key to the problem is that understanding the track and the structure have to be decoupled from each other. And as David points out, and it's difficult for a lot of people to understand this, that the, longitude, the, the rail itself never expands or contracts. It, Otherwise, you stand in a station platform and see the rail moving backwards and forwards. The rail's held down uh, either with sleepers in the ballast or by the fastening system. It doesn't, it doesn't move anywhere. But the structure does. So you have to decouple the two as far as possible. And this is where this, um, this device called the Zero the ZLR comes in. And we'll see a bit more on that in a minute. This allows the horizontal displacement of the structure to take place without inducing the stress into the rail itself. <coughs> As an example coming up. So, just to recap, the, um, the forces in the rail, expansion contraction due to the deck and traction and braking from the trains. These are the main uh, problems with the, uh, the, uh, the, uh, developing the rail stress. Um, and these are specified in 7743 and 1991 too. The um, data, so data was put into the uh, Pandrel software for this particular this particular structure. It's about 225, 230 meters long, um, a balanced cantilever for uh, crossing the river. You'll see that. And this is the type of data that's entered into the uh, in, into the uh, uh, software. Basically, just the basic properties of the, the box and the columns and the bearings and the temperature range and then the track itself, obviously the cross-section of rails, young monitors, fastening details and the um, uh, longitudinal displacement oh, yes, of the rail, that's one millimetre. Um, this, uh, so this case study in, utilised the Pandrel Sivoir programme and uh, analyzes the stress in the rails due to the loading, the various, lo various loading conditions. The particular example, there was a high stress of 106 megapascals over the left-hand column of the structure. And that's this, this fella here. The, as, you, as you heard, 92 <coughs> is the limit, but there's a peak here in the rail, rail stress of 106. So that had to be removed. Um, and the calculation was to install these Viper uh, base plate assemblies with the ZLR uh, rail fastening <coughs> over a 16 metre zone either side of the column centres, uh, which reduced the stress from 106 to a more acceptable 88 megapascals. And this is what happens. This is the, uh, this is the lowest stress level in the rail. And I'll show you the two graphs side by side. You can see the difference here. That's the, the peak, and that's the section with the ZLRs. And there's also a reduction in this, uh, in this uh, the rail stress, which goes down to a more acceptable value there. Uh, sorry, that's the displacement. That's the rail displacement. <coughs> you can see these in the, in the paper, published paper. So... Um, by using these fastenings, we were able to solve the problem of the high rail stress and avoid the use of the rail expansion joint. And the, um, the, the actual ZLR looks something like this. 
No, I'm, um, I, I'm hoping that this gap is actually for, for, for illustration views, because uh, it should be, I think it should be a bit less, but uh, I've discussed it with David. We can, uh, I mean, it's, uh, it, it's, a, it's a, an example to show how the, 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 the load applied by the fastening is released from the foot, and it allows this rail section to remain where it is and the structure to move underneath without inducing the stress. And this, this will restrain the, uh, also restrain the rail from roll and from lateral, lateral movement. Okay, I've finished. These, uh, so just to finish off, these are examples of uh, the structures built in Bangkok for the metro. And hopefully something like this will be appearing on HS2 before long. Uh, this is an overhead section with the connection to the depot. Um, this is through the streets of Bangkok. Uh, the purple line, which is uh, now open for operation. Quite impressive. These structures had to be built to, cr to cross over the um, expressway interchanges. They built all the freeway system, realised the freeway system couldn't cope with the traffic. And they said, oh, we better build a metro. And so the metro has to go over the top of all the um, interchanges in Bangkok, which is, results in these incredible structures. This is the uh, plinth system on the uh, top of the railway viaducts. With the, these are just standard eclipse. And uh, just to show you the ZLR in a rather exceptional situation in Hong Kong, um, on the South Island line, where we've got a, a series of clips to, to suit the structural movement of the viaducts at a very um, congested area into, uh, uh, in, in, into the station here. And it's got a high, this, um, the high toe load in grey, the medium toe load in green, which is here, and then the ZLR in yellow. So on that colourful note, we close our lecture. Thank you. <laughs>